Bonjour. Dans cette euh, belle salle d'Agora de la Villette, je suis sûr que les Romains seraient jaloux de nous voir ici. Vous vous rappelez, lorsqu'ils voulaient discuter de sujets très importants, ils allaient dans leurs Agora et puis ils euh, étaient inspirés par les dieux. Euh, vous me permettrez d'abord, en tant qu'Africain, euh, de remarquer qu'il pleut à Paris. Euh, dans la cosmogonie africaine, Lorsqu'il pleut, ça veut dire que les dieux vous envoient leur bénédiction. Donc je voudrais en notre nom euh, remercier la divinité euh, de nous avoir accepté les réalisations de nos travaux. Et je peux vous assurer que cette pluie à Paris euh, n'a rien à voir avec le changement climatique, c'est une pluie tout à fait naturelle. Mais ça n'exonère pas Paris, Paris euh, comme toute grande ville, et toujours impacté par le changement climatique, est un impacteur du changement climatique. Ce qui sera notre thème d'aujourd'hui, uh, « the, the, the urban way of dealing with uh, climate change uh, ». I have a great panel uh, with me uh, today. Uh, let me um, uh, list you whom we have here. Uh, governor Hassan Joho, who is the governor of Mon Mombasa, I always call Mombasa Magic Mombasa. I would like to invite you to go and visit it. You'll be enchanted by the spirit of the city. Governor, welcome. Thank you very much. And I have with me Kamal Karazi, a former Minister of Foreign Affairs of Iran, uh, who will uh, give us the, the perspective of the state. Governor will give us the perspective of an emerging city in fighting uh, climate change. And uh, 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 Mr. Karazi will give us the perspective of the state. Uh, my third uh, panelist will be Stefano Mansevirsi, uh, doesn't need introduction. Uh, he is the Director General for International Cooperation and Development of the European Commission and a, uh, a champion in climate change. So, uh, uh, Stefano, welcome. Uh, Denis Duverne, uh, on my right hand side, who is the Chairman of AXA, but also uh, leading the Investment Development Forum, the International sure. Forum. Uh, welcome, uh, Denis. And then uh, I'll have Laurence Tobiana, CEO from the European Climate Foundation, who will uh, give us the political economy of uh, climate change, the urban way. But before uh, we really start the discussion, let me say how pleased I am as UNDP uh, to be uh, an institutional partner of the uh, uh, Paris Peace Forum. Uh, I think this is uh, quite, you will see it ontological because Uh, the discussion that we'll have here will shape our future. And I'm glad that we're having it in Paris. Uh, Paris, which is the city of light, but also the city of enlightenment. Uh, whenever we have been lost in time or lost in our mind or lost our reason, uh, we congregate here in Paris uh, to find the way forward. I remember three years ago uh, when we um, uh, could not handle an agreement in Copenhagen. We came here inspired by the the lights of Paris, and we have the, um, the Paris Agreement, which is quite, again, ontological, because it, does, it will define our very existence for the future. So Paris was the rendezvous to find the solution. Again, we are here um, to celebrate the, uh, the 100th anniversary of the uh, armistice. Um, so when we suffered in the Great War, war we came to Paris to find a solution. And I would submit that um, Here in the discussion, we can find an armistice uh, for climate change. But do remember that uh, in the 18th century, when we needed enlightenment, when we lost our reason, uh, it was Paris that was give us uh, reason to hope. Uh, those of you who have read the, the Diderot, the Montesquieu, the Voltaire, uh, and Haute Marche, uh, the, um, uh, the, phil the, uh, the German philosophers, Emmanuel Kant, Haute uh, Marche, we had this, um, uh, the, the great philosopher Hobbes and others that were en enlightening us. And I'm glad to say that today we have uh, in my panel here a reincarnation of those philosophers of, of, of enlightenment that will lighten the way forward. But my question that I want to pose to uh, my five panelists here is the following. Uh, climate change uh, is something particular in the sense, I mean, especially on the cities. Cities occupy only 2% of the, of the planet. Yet, they generate 80% of GDP. 
and 70% 70, 70 of global greenhouse. And they are the greatest impacted because most of the cities are on the, on the, on the, near to the sea. So very, very exposed to climate change. So we cannot deal with climate change if we don't have the cities as a vector because they are the greatest impactor and the greatest impactee. So my, 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 our challenge, our ask uh, to the panelists here is just to guide us forward. Uh, how can the city uh, help us uh, deal with the climate change? Uh, that's the question I want to pose to you. Uh, let me start by asking Hassan uh, to give me the perspective of an emerging, emerging city. How can we smart our cities to be great uh, climate fighters? Hassan, over to you. Oh, well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Moderator. Let me first of all confirm that uh, rain actually symbolizes blessings in Africa. And begin this conversation that um, I got excited when I had uh, this opportunity to engage on matters climate change as a city. Because one, um, the conversation uh, generally was seen to be a national conversation. And like you've rightly put it, it cities are more impacted, <laughs> obviously, because of urbanization trend, uh, uh, competitive nature of cities uh, wanting to outdo the other. And therefore, it comes with, with a lot of uh, challenges and opportunities. So therefore, I'm imagining um, a city that is growing like Mombasa or other cities, probably within the African uh, setup, have, have an opportunity to, to plan well and plan it right. And the point for far too long, people have been discussing climate change at, at a national level, but there's always certainly uh, seen uh, that there's political uh, um, goal shift because of, uh, of the certainly foreign policies of different nations and different uh, moments. But I can give you an example, and I, can, I will move away slightly from, from uh, climate change to peace and tranquility and prosperity for cities. And the perfect example is uh, matters of CVE, PVE, where cities suffered immensely. But then at some point cities decided that they needed to talk. They needed to share experiences. They needed to share stories. And hence they've, they've made tremendous strides. So for me, it's not any different with, the, with climate change. And I would say the perfect example is the, is the forum of uh, the mayors of, of the United States of America. Even if there's the national conversations, whether to believe or not that climate change is a reality, people are asking, what, what can we do as cities? And therefore, for me, I think that uh, we need to largely look at how we plan, how we move away from use of uh, fossil uh, fuel in our cities. How do we make our cities uh, walkable? How do we make our cities cyclable? How do we ensure that we create an environment for, for the non-motorized traffic to, to be efficient so that uh, we move away from, you know, from use of fossil Yesterday, my president had a presentation. And he said, even though we are, we are most impacted as Africa, but the point is, if you looked at Kenya, for example, 60% of, of, our, of our energy is renewable. And that's the focus. How do we move it forward? But then we want to develop. How do we develop without impacting the, the, the environment? We want, we want a healthy nation, we want uh, sanitation, environment, and largely climate change to be looked after. But then where is the balance? Because we want also to grow. And to develop, you certainly need to have energy. So the balance is, on the onset, we have an advantage to learn from, from, from other success stories elsewhere. So for me, I found this really to be an opportune moment that I can be in Paris once again to discuss uh, what is it that cities can do. Obviously, uh, there is every, every person would want to get to, into the city. We have the urbanization trend over the period, 50 years post-independence. But do we need to, what do we need to do to, 
to prepare well. So that even if you have an influx of a population that comes into your city, you look at, uh, at uh, prudent uh, management of uh, public transport, uh, infrastructure that supports uh, general public transport, integrated transport systems. In Mombasa, for example, we are lucky that we are an island. There's nothing that stops us from using DAO that moves by wind, you know, from one channel to another. We have uh, uh, 26, 226 kilometers square um, island. Uh, that we could promote for people to walk from one point to another, but with an integrated uh, mode of transport. So the huge challenges, but the way we are making strides, in my opinion, is to move from high consuming uh, um, lights or energy to LED. Um, uh, we are getting uh, people to walk. We're encouraging, we're talking to them. You need to walk one kilometer, two kilometers, or even, or even more so. So there is quite some challenges, but again, there is uh, tremendous opportunities. But what I like about this conversation is that you are getting cities to talk, even though we would probably have challenges with our national politics, but nothing stops me from talking to Copenhagen, to Dakar, to, to New York, for that matter. What is it that we can do together as cities uh, in matters of climate change? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Governor. Thank you for um, um, uh, bringing the centrality of, uh, of planning and preparedness in dealing with cities. And, and I like also the fact that you uh, brought uh, climate change in the bigger e equation of what we call in the, the five Ps in the uh, Sustainable Development Agenda. It's not only our planet, we'll discuss it later, how do we redefine our social contract between people and planet, but it's all the five Ps people, planet, partnerships, and to bring prosperity. And you are right, cities are also leaders of prosperity. As I said in my preamble, they generate 80% of GDP, so they have to be part of the equation of transforming uh, the world. Uh, but yours is a, a perspective from a state, from, from the cities. Um, let me, by the way, uh, use this platform to um, recognize the excellent work that the coalition of mayors are doing, and especially C40. I think this is, this is quite... Uh, seminal, the work they are doing. Uh, but let me turn to Karazi, Mr. Karazi, to, uh, because the state is a collection of cities. Uh, we, we got the perspective from, from cities. But how would you, uh, from the state, um, uh, view, uh, support uh, the, 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 the ideas that the uh, governor has just put forward? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Moderator. As a matter of fact, uh, in developing countries, the responsibility of estates is at most. Uh, not only in terms of uh, putting regulations and compliance with the Climate Change Convention and Paris Agreement, but uh, also to put a budget and to prepare the ground for public awareness and many other issues. The responsibility of the state uh, can be summarized in uh, building climate resiliency in urban areas. As you put it, urban areas are producing 70% of the uh, gas, uh, greenhouse gas. And therefore, resiliency in urban areas is one of the important responsibilities of the states to be developed. I think that uh, to do that, three clusters of issues has to be taken into consideration. The first cluster is, uh, to, is the prerequisites for uh, resiliency. That includes uh, devising institutional organizations and data platforms creating organizational mechanisms, establishing greenhouse gases emissions inventory, setting up financial mechanisms at times of extreme weather events, and finally enhancing relevant public citizens' awareness. This is cluster one. In cluster two, is the measures that relates to mitigation. And in that sense, uh, to 
reduce emissions, uh, the states have to promote uh, uh, energy, transportation, construction, evaluating the natural resources, urban forestation and expansion of green spaces, setting up financial mechanisms to raise adequate budget. In cluster three is the question of adaptation. And in that regard, urban infrastructures, public health and sanitation, water conservation, and protection against flood waters is very important. In doing these responsibilities in Iran, we have uh, taken measures uh, in terms of uh, um, mitigation, for example, the fuel quality have uh, upgraded, uh, both diesel and gasoline. Uh, natural gas vehicles have been increased. We have promoted taxis and many other vehicles to use natural gas instead of uh, gasoline or uh, diesel. Mandatory use of filters for diesel vehicles. Introduction of first low emission zone in the nation. Enforce periodic test and inspection for light duty vehicles, which is mandatory. And subsidize for hybrid electric vehicles and electrical motor cycles. Uh, Right now, PM 2.5 uh, has been slightly reduced in Tehran, for example, as a large city. And from 44 in 2010 to 32 in 2017. We have expanded green areas in Tehran, as an example. For example, before revolution, I mean, 40 years ago, the per capita for uh, a screen for, for green space was one square meter, and now it has reached to 25.16 uh, square meters. So it's big <coughs> development. Also, expansion of uh, uh, green spaces from 3,400 hectares before revolution to 55,000 hectares right now. An expansion of city parks from 75 city parks to 2,238 uh, parks today. And uh, <clears throat> uh, also we have tried nationally to develop uh, rail transport, uh, although there has been 17.4 billion passenger kilometers per year, now it has increased to 34.2 uh, billion passengers uh, per year. Also, renewal of city bus fleets by retirement on 17,000 old diesel power buses and CNG powered city buses. Renewal of city taxi fleets by retirement of 140,000 old gasoline fuel taxis and introduction of dedicated CNG powered long range taxis. So all of these uh, have been helpful. Uh, more than that, Scientifically, uh, Iran has been trying to develop uh, new technologies to reduce uh, uh, greenhouse gas. For example, uh, in nanotechnology, as you know, Iran is one of the leading countries, one of the tens, uh, I mean, the ranked one of the tens countries around the world. And uh, for example, we have developed uh, filters, which is in terms of a long time, lifetime, uh, it has uh, increased 
200% the lifetime of the filters. It's nano filters. And uh, also, uh, it has been used in different turbines. It has uh, reduced the electricity used by different countries, this kind of filters. As well for automotive air filters, uh, filters have been produced which uh, enhances 12.5% of absorption uh, capability and 10% enhancement in filtration efficiency mm -hmm. and reduction of hydrocarbon up to 20% and reduction of CO gas up to 30%. So these are good technological developments. Uh, also recently we have uh, <clears throat> been able to produce nanogasoline, which is new technology. Uh, and nanogasoline has better quality. It's EU5 quality and would be cheaper than other kinds of gasoline. So in terms of technology as <coughs> well, we have been trying to help. Mm -hmm. to help uh, reduce uh, uh, emissions and to uh, have uh, and to I mean enforce resiliency in the urban cities mm -hmm. but of course we face problem as well the problem of budget the problem of technology because as you know Iran is under sanction and being under sanction naturally we have less access to technology and uh, for example I tell you one example for example during the previous uh, round of sanctions we could not import gasoline although Iran is oil producer but we prefer to import gasoline all those years when the sanction was enforced against Iran we were not able to import any more gasoline so what they did was to use petrochemical gasoline, which was a factor for pollution and created a lot of problems for the cities. Of course, after that, we decided to uh, develop our refineries. And hopefully, now we produce gasoline inside the country. And by the end of the year, we will be quite uh, self-sufficient in terms of gasoline. So sanctions is an important factor which has to be taken into uh, consideration. If you are looking for climate change, which is a worldly matter, naturally sanctions cannot uh, be acceptable because if there is sanction on Iran, uh, other neighbors would also suffer because Iran would not be in a good shape to develop uh, resiliency in urban cities. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Minister. Uh, listening to you and to the governor, I see already emerging an algorithm to solve the equation I pose to you, uh, uh, precisely the urban way to drive the fight uh, uh, um, against climate change. Um, I will later on let uh, Laurence uh, do the political economy of it, but I see uh, a solution forward where cities would be driving on, on planning and prepar preparedness. A state will be doing the supportive role in terms of the right regulatory policy and the heavy lifting on, on investment, especially those that li related to technology. Uh, but we'll come back to it later. Uh, let, me, let me take the, the, the perspective of uh, Stefano uh, to see um, how um, I would always call the AU an engine in driving climate change. Uh, not only in supporting the states, but also going a little bit um, capillar down to supporting the cities. Um, what would be your perspective on this discussion so far? Well, thank you. Uh, our perspective, which is very much based on our, on our European approach, uh, is uh, to work with the cities and the local authorities, uh, both on mitigation and adaptation. I mean, mitigation because it has been recalled, you know, the 75% uh, of the CO2 emissions coming out from cities, uh, and the, mm, the same percentage is the energy which is uh, also consumed. It's more or less 75 and 75. 
So therefore, it is important that we deal uh, with the two aspects together, because otherwise our impact will be certainly, certainly smaller. Uh, on, on adaptation in particular, I have to say that we have to underline that the cities are uh, also are very vulnerable in the sense that uh, uh, natural disasters and uh, radical change in climate are also changing the way in which the territory is managed. You know, it is true that today and in Africa and uh, <coughs> elsewhere, raining is uh, something very important coming from Brussels to say it's quite normal. <laughs> but uh, to say that this year is a bit less normal precisely because the impact of climate change has reduced also the, uh, I mean the, the rain. So therefore there is an impact every day in what we are doing, our living together in the communities. Therefore, vulnerability is extremely important. I would like to recall that, uh, you know, disasters which are created by um, impact of the climate change is uh, having an impact in growing poverty. Eh? Therefore, there is a link between wh all what we are saying. If we want to work uh, SDGs framed, Agenda 2030, sustainability. Well, sustainability, if makes sense here, makes sense precisely because it allows people to, uh, uh, let's say, live in a world which is manageable and therefore is not just uh, under the constant threat of uh, its vulnerability. And towns and local authorities are particularly vulnerable to all this. In our approach, therefore, in order to deal with the uh, adaptation and mitigation alike, uh, the key issue is to invest in governance uh, and uh, empowering, in a sense, uh, to en enhance the capacities of local authorities to plan and uh, to formulate public policies and investments in a way which is enabling to deal uh, with two aspects, uh, consumption and emission. And I think that this is particularly important because, uh, you know, the governance is uh, the way in which you can, as the governor of Mombasa said, link together the choices for urban transport, uh, the choices for water supply, the choices uh, for energy, energy consumption and the quality of this. So governance is the most important issue because it implies also to pass from uh, sectorial policies which are, let's mm, say, very often developed in, in silos, I mean, following what is uh, the specificity of each policy and the necessity to have a global, a global vision. Now, this is our approach, which is very much based on our experience in Europe. Now, we are translating that into actions uh, in order to support concretely all this. For example, the Global Covenant of Mayor, which is a clear example of how we can federate together local authorities in order to have one of the biggest platforms uh, in the world in which local authorities are compare notes, are uh, sharing experiences, are precisely telling stories on how we can do it better. Only in, Afri in Sub-Saharan Africa, there are already more than 300 uh, cities which are members of this network. Second, uh, uh, through our scheme, which is the Global Alliance for Climate Change, you know, we are supporting also what uh, uh, cities are doing in terms of contributing in implementing the national determined contribution. Remember, these were agreed in Paris precisely at the national plan. Well, the national plan certainly uh, require a national framework, uh, but uh, they require also the capacity to deliver at local level if uh, the starting point uh, is reminding 75% of emission, 75% of consumption. If we bypass this, we'll never be able to, um, to manage. Third aspect is uh, to, let's say, to encourage twinnings, you know, sharing of experience. For example, we have just published a call for proposal, just, uh, uh, you know, in order to, um, uh, to, to, uh, enhance the capacity of sharing the governance experience between European towns, for example, and towns in developing countries, not only in Africa. We have already experiences on this, you know, what we are doing in Monrovia, in Conakry, in Port-au-Prince, where all, can, all, all towns in which just uh, the waste disposal was not well managed. And starting from this, it has been created, let's say, a sort of virtual circle in which from a better waste disposal, there is a cleaner energy which is also available for local uh, consumption. There is a third aspect on which I would like to underline, maybe uh, we can come back together, is that uh, increasingly we need to involve private investment. You know, And the schemes that we are setting up now, which is in uh, consisting in de-risking private investment, uh, it could be particularly useful because uh, uh, very often towns, according to the 
taxation system, you know, need to have access to resources, but without going through the national circuit. But this is, uh, is it costs money, you know. Money is not necessarily available to cities to the same level of rate of interest for which is available to the to, to, to national government. Therefore, there is a problem of availability. If a city is, uh, is selling bonds, for example, in order to finance, who is buying this bond? At which rate? Now, uh, we are precisely working on concrete schemes on which we are now working in order to de-risk investment, in order to give access to more affordable resources, financial resources, to the cities, and to allow private investors to invest in those infrastructures, in those uh, interconnections, in water, in urban transport, etc., which are contributing uh, to a better governance. But my, my last point is also another thing. Working with the local authorities is not only working in town, is also working in the rural side in order to limit the tendency of people going into the, the big cities. Because let's uh, recall one figure in Africa, 90% of the rural population has no access to electricity, meaning therefore that the risk is that uh, these people are moving into the town, increasing both the consumption and the CO2 emissions, and depriving a territory of uh, human resources. So we are, we are also, let's say, investing into this, you know, in particular with schemes like Electrify, uh, that in Eastern Africa in particular are particularly effective, you know, in order to help rural communities to be equipped with clean energy and equipped uh, with a better perspective to remain where they are and not increasing the urbanization process, which is very much part of the problem and not all of the solution. So therefore, we are working along these lines. And I have to say, in this, we are very much inspired by our experience in Europe. Eh? And therefore, we try to share this uh, to support and to, and to uh, let's say, be partner in order to give means in order for local authorities to do by themselves, because this is the most important thing. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Stefano. Quite comprehensive, and I, I'm glad you uh, you're putting the pressure uh, on the on a critical element, which is uh, governance, which is at the center of all this. That's why I always say that goal number 16 is the mother of the goals. Uh, it touches all of them, and investing on governance, having the governance right, uh, is the way to go forward. And I like the pass you, I mean, the bridge you you're giving to uh, to the chair of AXA when you talked about, um, uh, Dennis, when you talked about the private sector. But let me add another bridge. And you're right, um, we have to invest both on mitigation and adaptations. Uh, we, when, we, when we deal with climate change, we have to work with those two strong legs. I would submit that there is another third leg, which is extremely important. And we have a little bit downplayed in the international negotiation, loss and damage. And it's where I'll come back to you uh, uh, Dennis, coming from an insurance company, um, uh, how would you factor in that element uh, from, from, from your own work? Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, as an insurer, AXA is uh, clearly concerned by the increasing occurrence of, uh, of uh, climate-related uh, extreme events, uh, and particularly on cities, and we believe that uh, we, we can help cities transition to a low-carbon economy and reduce their systemic risk. And we see uh, our action in three, uh, three dimensions. The first one is prevention. As an industry, we, need to, uh, we, we have decided to work with cities to strengthen their uh, pre-event resiliency, uh, to uh, uh, allow them to be better protected against the natural disasters. And we have taken uh, several steps in, uh, in this direction uh, in developing uh, partnerships with uh, other institutions and supporting academic research uh, in that area. The second area is protection, i.e. ensuring effectively uh, to uh, protect cities, companies, and individuals against natural events through, their, through the insurance and reinsurance of, uh, of their losses. And the third uh, element, and uh, this uh, uh, was mentioned several times by the previous speakers, uh, investment, because the insurers are also investors. Uh, to ensure, we uh, need to uh, uh, have assets on our balance sheet because we receive the, uh, uh, the, the premiums paid by our uh, customers first and we have to invest them to be able to pay their claims later. As an investor, we invest in green infrastructure and uh, I will come back to that later. So first, first prevention, as I said, uh, this prevention starts with building partnerships. 
we have been very uh, uh, sensitive to the uh, first uh, uh, global partnership, the Insure Resilience Global Partnership that uh, was uh, set up at the initiative of, uh, uh, of Germany by the G20 in, tw in 2017, uh, which uh, covers now, uh, which, which counts 40 members, including France, and AXA has recently agreed to join the Insure Resilience Global Partnership. Uh, but this partnership goes beyond that. We uh, have also joined the uh, Insurance Development Forum, which was created in the aftermath of COP21 in Paris as an unprecedented uh, public-private uh, partnership, which uh, brings together the World Bank, United Nations Development Programme, so your institution, uh, and the uh, large insurers, uh, reinsurers and brokers. And the objective of the, of the Insurance Development Forum are fully aligned with the Insure Resilience Global Partnership, i.e. to contribute to uh, insuring 400 million people in emerging uh, markets affected by climate change. Uh, I have taken the chairmanship of, uh, uh, of this uh, Insurance Development program, uh, Forum, the steering committee of the, of the forum, uh, and I have as co-chairman uh, Arim Steiner from uh, UNDP and the administrator of, of UNDP, and uh, uh, Joachim Levy, who is the uh, CFO of the, of the World Bank. Our objective is to uh, uh, contribute uh, through uh, sovereign and sub-sovereign schemes, so uh, 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 country schemes, uh, to insure 300 million uh, people, and through microinsurance, insuring 100 million more people. We have catalogued uh, all the uh, risk mapping and modeling as, uh, systems because we want to make uh, those models available to uh, countries and, uh, and cities. Uh, and we are uh, also looking at the uh, uh, legal aspects because uh, we would like uh, insurance to become easier to do in those, uh, in those, uh, in those markets. Uh, another initiative that we have taken uh, uh, at the uh, global level is our partnership, uh, access partnership with UN Habitat, uh, which we signed in 2016, where we have decided to uh, develop with UN Habitat over three years, uh, uh, I would say, directives or uh, guidelines to, uh, to create uh, homes that uh, are uh, at the time of the rebuilding after a uh, catastrophic event homes that are resilient to uh, future natural catastrophes. Uh, the second aspect of those partnerships is partnership with cities themselves. Uh, AXA in uh, 2018 has launched a partnership with C40, which was mentioned uh, earlier, a network of the world's mega cities committed to addressing climate change. And because we cannot handle the, the, the 40 at the same time, we have decided to, uh, uh, to work initially with four cities, Bangkok in Thailand, Bogota in Colombia, Jakarta and, uh, and, Mil and Manila. Uh, and finally, uh, uh, on, on the partnership side, we've also developed academic research uh, through our uh, philanthropic arm, the AXA Research Fund, uh, and we have uh, supported a joint research initiative with uh, Dr. Uh, Vasken Andreasian from ISTA in France to, ma to model the floods. And this, uh, this, the model that has been developed as a result of this partnership is now used in the Loire Valley to prevent, uh, to prevent flooding. Uh, second, the second chapter is protection, and it's uh, really insurance. Uh, in Mexico, uh, we have uh, launched uh, a, a product called Cat Micro, uh, following the catastrophic earthquakes in 2017, it's, it's 2017 which allows uh, uh, the uh, uh, residents of, uh, of uh, Mexico City uh, to have a simplified uh, home insurance where they can save uh, for uh, three years uh, to progressively access the insurance because uh, there is the issue of, affordab of affordability. And we have developed uh, uh, parametric uh, solutions which are based on the indices, which are now available for cities to insure themselves. But I, again, I insist that prevention is as important as, uh, as protection. Uh, uh, we, we have uh, solutions that are available for cities that want to, uh, uh, I would say, ensure uh, their infrastructure uh, against, uh, against major catastrophes. And we have also participated in uh, more global schemes like the uh, Caribbean uh, Catastrophe Risk Insurance Facility and the African Risk Capacity. The third uh, chapter is investment. Uh, I mentioned the fact that uh, we are big investors. We have, uh, at the time of, uh, <coughs> of, the of the Climate Forum in uh, January 17, 
announced that we would increase our invest investments from 3 billion euros uh, in 2017 to, 10 billion, to 12 billion euros by 2020. Uh, so it's essentially uh, green bonds. We believe that uh, we need more uh, green infrastructure and this uh, infrastructure is also available to cities. But again, here, uh, a partnership between public and uh, private institutions is, uh, is necessary, as uh, 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 Mr. Mansavesi mentioned. Uh, the issue of uh, large insurance companies is the uh, quality of the assets they invest in. And uh, we have uh, partnered with IFC, uh, the, uh, the, 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 World, the, the World Bank uh, institution, uh, to um, to get a rating uplift uh, on uh, some of the investments that uh, uh, were in emerging markets because we needed this rating uplift to be able to uh, invest in investment grade assets and this is clearly an area where public private partnership needs to be further developed yeah. so <clears throat> Thank you very much for your attention, and happy to take your questions. Thank you, uh, thank you, Dennis, for bringing this 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 part in the equation. I mean, um, dealing with the SDGs in general and climate change in particular will, will call for heavy lifting. And I mean, we all know that the institutional investors uh, have to be part of it. And and I'm glad that, as we said earlier, uh, that. Uh, uh, neglected area in this discussion has been lost and damaged and having proper insurance uh, could be a, a salvation. Um, I'm glad you, you, you're putting it forward. Um, 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 Laurence, I, I would like to appoint you as the deputy moderator and look a little bit at the uh, political economy on the way forward as we are going to Poland for COP24 and then uh, gearing to preparing the SG, UN SG's conference next year on climate change. Uh, listening to the discussion here and using also the NDCs as a kind of vector forward, how do you project the future all the way down to Poland and New York next year? Thank you. Uh, first, recognizing that uh, in shaping the discussion for Paris Agreement when I was a uh, Ambassador, the special representative for the French government, to to really prepare and, and conduct that negotiations. Um, the initial idea, which finally revealed very efficient, was that it was not it was something bigger than an agreement itself between government. It was a mobilization of many, many, many stakeholders, and cities, of course, were the key factor, the key element. Uh, that has to, in a way, design their own plans, and there uh, will be, uh, in a way, agreement. And it hasn't shown true. Well, the truth was, the moment of truth was when the U.S. decided to withdraw, when the U.S. government decided to withdraw. The U.S. society, a big part of it, decided we, we want to stay. Uh, the movement we are still in was basically... Uh, uh, prepared and, and driven by cities. I remember the declaration, I think it was the beginning of 2017, uh, the cities saying, we are still in. We don't, maybe uh, in Washington they withdraw, but we are not. The U.S. cities were saying we are not. So that's really important. It was a plan in designing Paris Agreement to say, anyway, it can't be government only. It has to be broader. It has to be citizen movement. It has to be private sector, region, states, and cities. And again, that's a proof of the concept. We, sh we, we see it here. I'm very pleased to see that your city is saying, anyway, we are continuing. We don't care about the lows and the highs of global politics. This global politics, of course, played a role. And as you mentioned, minister sanctioned or the trade war between China and, and US and many others. Of, of course, we feel that in the climate uh, movement, the negotiation, the capacity of governments to deliver, because there are many other issues, and of course war and others, that really put climate change really down on the political agenda. That's why now cities are so important to maintain the drive, the intention, the value. So again, I recognize uh, all the efforts that have been done the, the cities have for 2020, most of them, and now are thinking about further, going further, design their plan for clean transport, for clean air, for uh, resilient houses, uh, and, and all these elements, and even some cities want to go 100% uh, providing uh, clean energy. 
So what is, for me, the, the essential role of cities in the next two years? Why these two years? We have received and read the report of IPCC showing that we have really to act very quickly. And there is a big difference between a, a global temperature rising by 2 degrees C compared to pre-industrial levels and 1.5. And 1.5 seems very, very difficult, yes. Two de well below 2 degrees C is very difficult as well. But just the impact now is really measurable. We, we see it already, unfortunately, and it's going worse. So now we know that. We know that this first round of NDCs that were presented before the Paris Agreement uh, conclusion uh, were never enough. We have to do more. So we have to revise their contribution. And initially, I remember when I made in 2014, when I was talking, presenting my plan to the French government, I was saying, the cities has to have their own contribution. Mm -hmm. and, and they have now to say, of course, we, we make commitments for 2020. Where are we? But now where's the next wave of this contribution from cities are? And even if I, a very important element before 2020, in particular for of course, the major cities, but that, that can drive the many other cities who are involved in the Global Covenant, which I'm really happy we, at my foundation, we host this Global Covenant. It's to look at the longer term, what our cities will be if we were really consistent with Paris Agreement goal. How much clean transport or clean, clean air or clean energy? What kind of reform and transformation and governance we have to have to deliver that? That's why really uh, many, and, and I am one of them, pushing for cities to put their 2050, when possible, net zero plan, net zero carbon plan. Some have done that already, uh, more than, than 55, uh, uh, it, it's go, go, going on. Cities have said, we will take that commitment, more ambitions at government, will present that probably in the summit in, in September 2019 or, or around 2020. The way we consider that we will deliver more than government. That's essential to give courage to government. Again, looking at the geopolitics that are playing around climate change, even if climate change is not the problem, well, it's, it should be a collective action, uh, we see that the governments need courage and need to be inspired by that we can do it. The idea is that there are solutions. Uh, we know how to finance. At least we have good ideas. We have the technologies, and there is a push for new technologies. And the cities can play this role because they can be uh, more ambitious. And, and look at the transport, for example. If many cities since September 2019 or by 2020 design transport plans that really make the transition to clean transport, they can decide that, many of them. Sometimes it's it, when I look at my country or Germany or some others, it can be tension with the government. But if the countries, the cities decide to do that, that give a very, very strong market signal to automotive sector, to the providers of services of transportation, to the financial sector, because that we see then there is a big investment. So that's a fantastic capacity of in the real economy domain that the TCs can deliver. And that could encourage the government to go further, because we need them to go further. And we need them by 2020 or by 2021, when hopefully having a, I'm not a diplomat anymore, having a new <laughs> administration in the United States, more attentive to climate change, then we, we can relaunch the global political uh, movement. But meanwhile, we need the cities, together with the private sector and the citizen movement, to hold, to be strong and clear of what we want to achieve. Mm -hmm. And again, if by 2020 we see that so many has been achieved in terms of the cost of clean energy, uh, which is happening already, or in terms of clean transport, I bet that many governments would say, we, we continue, we do better, we can do better. Mm. So that's my hope. And I see how much, of course, this uh, positive loop between cities' ambition, decision-making, with, again, as uh, the president of AXA said, the, the new financial instrument that we needed, we didn't have them before, are now available for cities to go ahead. Uh, and there are so many examples, and so that's what's so exciting. Uh, that, I think, would allow citizens to look back to government and say, well, you are, you are to be accountable. You sign up this Paris Agreement. It's about raising ambition, not just doing the same you have 
thought in, it's not incremental, it's transformational. So that's why I think a lot of efforts has to highlight the role of cities, ask cities to look at their long term and put this long term plan in the eyes, in the front of the governments, because that will, in a way, in my view, enact a strong positive reaction from them. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Laurence, uh, you, you squared the circle because you landed on where the governor started. Uh, he started by saying that we need planning uh, in the cities, and you, 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 you close on that one. If, if there is something that is emerging out of the discussion, is that, yes, we have to, to heighten the level of ambition of the NDCs, but we may be moving from NDCs to CDCs, uh, cities uh, determine contribution. I think this can be a great outcome of the discussion. But let me, let me turn to the, to the audience. I, uh, I don't know if I, we have enough time, but uh, I know we have discussed the perspective of the cities, uh, of the states, of partners, of institutional investors, uh, of, of, um, of, of, the, of, of, of the political economy. Uh, we may not have uh, listened to the perspective of the citizens themselves. And I would take it that um, around this table, we, I mean, in this, in this Agora, we are the citizens, as in Rome, we used to say it. So citizens, what would be your views? Over to you. Uh, yes, number six. Bonjour à tous. Je voudrais savoir euh, pourquoi on ne mettrait pas une amende sévère à tous les pays signataires de l'accord de Paris sur le climat et qui ne respectent, qui ne respectent pas leurs engagements, dont l'Amérique en premier. Pourquoi on a peur de l'Amérique Merci. Merci beaucoup. Euh, numéro 2. Merci. Alors, merci pour euh, le peuple et pour la société civile. Alors, je suivi avec beaucoup d'intérêt les communications des uns et des autres et j'ai failli rester sur ma fin. Et je voudrais saluer le brillant exposé du patron de AXA. Il y a un élément qui n'a pas été pris en compte. Nous nous rendons compte que nous sommes devant le dilemme de la recherche du profit. Et pour Madame euh, Tobiana, est-ce que vous pensez réellement à la question de la transformation que vous souhaitez quand l'on pense que, maintenant que vous n'êtes plus diplomate, est-ce que nous ne nous trouvons pas dans une hypocrisie écologique, à savoir que Nicolas Hulot, qui a été le chantre et qui est le chantre de l'environnement, a dû démissionner d'un gouvernement parce qu'il s'est trouvé totalement en étroit Est-ce que vous pensez que cette transformation peut se faire devant les besoins et les poids économiques Et de l'autre côté, de tous les intervenants Personne n'a fait un lien entre la santé et l'environnement dans la recherche des statistiques pouvant démontrer les maladies émergentes et quand on sait ce que produit aujourd'hui la pollution et la prochaine COP se présentant donc à Pologne et nous voyons que depuis ce matin, Pologne est, est, est pratiquement s'est réveillée dans une buée. Qu'est-ce que vous dites de cette question santé environnement et de cette hypocrisie écologique maintenant que vous n'êtes plus diplomate Merci. Merci beaucoup. Euh, je prends peut-être deux autres questions. Après, je... numéro 6. Oui, bon, euh, bonsoir à tout le monde et très heureux d'être là. Euh, le monde est, est en face à des défis climatiques énormes, tout le monde le sait. Nous sommes en face aussi à des défis économiques. Et aujourd'hui, est-ce qu'on peut penser euh, remodeler le monde avec un système où on pourrait mettre en place une sorte de RSE, c'est-à-dire euh, qui va tout à fait euh, permettre aux entreprises de penser le monde dans tout ce qu'ils font euh, dans les pays africains et dans les autres pays, c'est-à-dire une charte euh, que les entreprises tout à fait valideront euh, dans les process qu'ils font dans les pays africains euh, sur les impacts sociaux, les impacts de développement et tout ça. Alors, pour finir, je voulais simplement euh, dire que dans les années à venir, euh, nous aurons peut-être euh, des métiers qui vont arriver qu'on ne connaît pas aujourd'hui. Est-ce qu'on peut savoir, est-ce qu'on peut commencer à travailler euh, euh, les jeunes enfants euh, de bas âge euh, pour leur donner la possibilité d'avoir 
une certaine connaissance de l'impact socio-économique, mais l'impact environnemental du monde pour qu'ils puissent grandir avec. Parce que quand on grandit avec des codes et des, des, des choses qu'on qu valide à bas âge, eh bien, on peut être tout à fait plus efficace et plus ouvert dans le monde que nous allons arriver. Merci beaucoup. Euh, le temps étant extrêmement limité, peut-être que je vais faire un rapide tour de table avec euh, mes panélistes et après on va conclure parce que je, dois, je pense qu'on doit finir vers 12h45. Euh, qui est volontaire pour euh, répondre le premier ou la première Je peux profiter de mon statut de non diplomate pour répondre. Vous savez, il y, a des, il y a des matins où je me réveille où je trouve ça très difficile. Hein. Euh, parce qu'on a plein de signaux négatifs, bien sûr, euh, de gouvernements qui n'arrivent pas, qui, qui pas à se décider, euh, les émissions mondiales qui continuent à augmenter, euh, du charbon qui recommence à être dans le pipeline de beaucoup de projets de développement. Euh, donc il y a des jours où c'est difficile le matin. Mais vous savez, on n'a pas le choix. Je crois que... Il y a eu des hauts et des bas sur cette question du changement climatique depuis que je suis ça depuis longtemps maintenant. Euh, et, et il y a vraiment eu des moments de, de prise de conscience et, et d'avancer et puis des moments de recul. Nous sommes dans un moment pour certaines parties de recul, mais en même temps d'avancer. Et quand je regarde 20 ans en arrière, il y a une différence fondamentale dans, quand même dans la situation dans laquelle on est aujourd'hui par rapport à il y a 20 ans. Par rapport à, à Rio 92... Euh, on a fait une avancée quand même considérable et on ne peut pas l'ignorer. Donc il faut à la fois, ce n'est pas facile d'être vraiment de, de, de bonne humeur tous les jours, mais je pense qu'on est en train de faire des transformations. Et si c'est vrai que les gouvernements sont souvent en retard par rapport à la société, parce que parfois ils n'arrivent pas à expliquer, euh, parfois ils n'arrivent pas à, à vraiment penser que c'est possible... Et euh, on, on va le voir pour la France qui doit aussi... Euh, euh, la France, les émissions françaises de gaz à effet de serre ont recommencé à augmenter. Euh, il faut qu'on trouve des réponses vraiment fortes. On attend euh, les annonces du gouvernement pour très bientôt. Euh, et, et on va évidemment y, vraiment attentif à ça. Mais c'est pour ça qu'il faut qu'il y ait sans arrêt ce, cette relation citoyen, ville et gouvernement pour qu'on y arrive. Concernant les sanctions, euh, bien sûr, si on avait voulu introduire les sanctions... Dans le système de Paris, malheureusement, personne n'aurait signé. On a essayé de le faire à Kyoto en 1997. Ça n'a pas marché parce qu'évidemment, euh, les gouvernements ne peuvent pas se mettre d'accord là-dessus. Mais on peut réfléchir. Et aujourd'hui, je pense que ça va émerger, notamment dans les relations commerciales. On va voir le lien de plus en plus entre la lutte contre le changement climatique et le commerce. Les pays qui vont vraiment être sérieux, eh bien, ils vont regarder leurs problèmes de compétitivité avec ceux qui ne sont pas sérieux. Et je pense qu'on va avoir des conséquences commerciales. Je ne veux pas aller plus loin, mais, mais en tout cas, c'est là que je vois le, la suite. C'est un peu ma réaction. Donc, euh, euh, alors, et pour finir sur les questions de santé, heureusement, on fait le lien maintenant entre changement climatique, les, les drivers de ce changement climatique, notamment l'utilisation des énergies fossiles et la pollution de l'air. Et je suis sûre qu'à Katowice, on, on va quand même faire prendre conscience à tous les gouvernements, même ceux qui ne sont pas les plus enthousiastes sur l'action du climat, et notamment euh, en Pologne, que c'est vraiment le moment d'agir. Et je crois que c'est ça qui a fait changer d'ailleurs très largement la position du gouvernement euh, polonais, notamment sur la poursuite du charbon. Thank you. Um... Uh, Gouverneur. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I want to begin by by pointing out what my brother there has said that uh, for people to come and invest in Africa, they need to to assess their impact and compensate. And I think that is where we're getting it wrong as Africa. We need to do our own assessment and develop what is viable. And we have an advantage. Africa is called the dark continent because we are coming from behind. Many of us are ahead of us. Many of our con other continents are ahead of us. But that gives us an opportunity to learn from be best practices and make our own decision. I have served as minister in government, so I've, I've played a critical role in national government. And now I'm governor of a city. And I can tell you, this war on climate change will be won in the cities. There is a conversation here I picked that people are saying that, uh, that we, we focus somewhat on, on the cities. 
obviously because of the contribution, basically on GDP and development and other economic activities. But there's also a tendency of the suburbs of a city or the rural areas of a country attempting to emulate how a city is run. So it all begins uh, with, with the city. And after listening to everybody, I feel we are at a point where collectively share our stories and experience and develop action plans that are supported by capital investment plan. And now there is uh, the chairman of the AXA has made it clear, we never had this before. It comes with the cost. We have had to deal with serious cat catastrophe, floodings um, uh, in our cities that cannot be explained, extreme weather, drought. But I don't think anybody would come and provide a solution uh, to me. I have to think of a solution myself. And the point is, how do I develop an action plan that can be supported by some way of, of some policy formulation or even legislation for that matter. Many of the African countries have got now devolved uh, gov governance. And somebody pointed out that we're not discussing health. We're generally discussing quality of life. And when you talk of quality of life, you must talk about health, you must talk about sanitation, um, by and large um, environment, and good standards of living. We know very well that uh, a lot of our diseases that we've had to deal with is a as a result of how we contribute negatively to our environment. And then we can't shy, shy away from that conversation. So in my opinion, and I would want to continue to say, this kind of conversation sh should continue. There has to be specific focus on how the cities will drive the agenda to fight climate change. Thank you, Thank Governor. You. Yeah, Dennis? <coughs> yes, uh, I agree that uh, the topic of uh, atmospheric pollution and health was uh, perhaps not even not uh, enough handled on our, on our panel. Uh, clearly, 80% uh, of people living in uh, urban areas uh, have access to an air which, is, uh, which has a level of pollution above the WHO uh, uh, levels. It's 56% in uh, uh, high-income countries, it's 98% in low- and middle-income countries. So the, this issue of uh, air pollution connected to, uh, uh, I would say, urbanization and climate change is clearly a, a, an important issue. Uh, <clears throat> one of the uh, uh, people in the audience uh, mentioned the, uh, uh, the, uh, the issue of uh, uh, profit in the private sector. I believe that uh, there is no contradiction uh, between uh, uh, the interest in the private, of the private sector and uh, the uh, drive to uh, uh, reduce the impact of climate change. On the contrary, I believe that the private sector has been instrumental at, uh, ahead of COP21 to uh, increase the awareness by the governments that a world at plus two degrees or more was not uh, sustainable. Insurers have uh, indicated that very clearly. And uh, I believe that there is a growing awareness in, at the UN level uh, that uh, insurance is a factor of development because it contributes to a better resilience of, uh, of, of cities. And uh, I fully share uh, Laurence Ubena's point of view that cities are going to be critical in the next phase if we want to be successful in the drive towards a, a world at uh, 1.5 degrees and not, uh, plus, uh, not plus 2 degrees. Still, the governments are central because they are the only ones that can set the price of carbon. And I believe uh, linking private and public, that's uh, uh, increasing the price of carbon is a key uh, ingredient if we want to solve that problem. And this is perhaps the point where cities alone cannot, uh, cannot be successful. But I truly support the point that cities will be critical uh, in the fight against climate change. Yeah. Stefano? Euh, oui, merci. Non, je, je crois que, que dans, dans notre travail, quand on parle de l'agenda de développement, de la coopération internationale, de la nécessité de transformer tout ça pour euh, être en mesure hein, euh, de, euh, de mettre en œuvre ce qu'on a agréé, euh, l'agenda 2030, les objectifs du développement soutenable. D'ailleurs, je rappelle, les objectifs du développement soutenable sont les résultats précisément de deux processus, le processus de Rio et le processus MDGs. 
Donc, quand, quand on discute de tout ça, pour changer un peu et pour, pour dire ce n'est plus une question, la coopération internationale, de transférer des ressources des plus riches aux plus pauvres, mais vraiment de changer la nature des politiques qu'on définit ensemble, eh bien, quand on parle de changement climatique, est probablement euh, le moment où tout le monde, effectivement, comprend ce qu'on veut dire. Parce que c'est quelque chose qu'on doit construire ensemble. Ce n'est plus les donateurs et les bénéficiaires. C'est vraiment un agenda à construire ensemble. Et ça demande de l'humilité un peu de deux côtés. Hein, C'est-à-dire d'affronter ce qui est la critique souvent qui est faite par les pays en développement, qui disent ben, « Merci, vous êtes développé en polluant, en détruisant le monde, et maintenant vous nous, vous nous demandez un effort supplémentaire ». En réalité, la question ne se pose plus comme ça. Et je crois qu'au niveau des citoyens, ça c'est bien compris, parce que c'est le quotidien. C'est le quotidien. Et il suffit de voir aussi les quelques sondages, les robaromètres et autres. Euh, il y a à côté surtout des jeunes... Disons, là, une, une conscience de ça qui, souvent, n'est pas, euh, euh, pas captée par les gouvernements. Les gouvernements sont trop, euh, sont très souvent dirigés par la politique de très court terme. Et donc, un jour, c'est quelque chose qu'il faut faire parce que euh, ça oriente l'opinion publique. Le, le jour après, il faut faire autrement. Et c'est là où, précisément, il y a souvent un manquement de la politique qui fait la synthèse. Mais la politique qui fait la synthèse, notamment pour ce qui concerne le changement climatique, je prétends se fait au niveau local. C'est là où les citoyens sont beaucoup plus disposés à dire, voilà, euh, c'est pas seulement une question de très, loin, très, très, très lointaine, mais c'est une question de notre vie quotidienne, de comment on peut travailler ensemble. C'est la santé, mais c'est la nutrition aussi. Ce sont les deux facteurs euh, qui frappent le plus en termes de mortalité dans les pays en, en, en développement. Mais ce sont les deux côtés de la même, de la même médaille. Si on ne change pas euh, le mix de, de, de politique publique, d'investissement euh, et de gouvernance, effectivement, on n'arrivera jamais. Et je pense que c'est précisément à ce niveau-là où il faut continuer à investir. Les questions d'assurance sur lesquelles on travaille ensemble, d'ailleurs, c'est fondamental, parce que, parce que l'assurance, c'est aussi un moyen, non seulement pour un investissement privé, mais aussi pour changer la méthode de la reconstruction par la suite, ce qu'on est en train de faire dans les Caraïbes, hein, après chaque passage. Euh, la, la question de, de l'assurance donne la possibilité de penser un peu plus loin et pas seulement de comment arriver au jour après. Mais sans avoir des politiques publiques qui soient soutenables et qui aient accès à des ressources, on n'arrivera pas. Les, les, je, je pense que ce qu'on est en train de, de faire avec d'autres, c'est de créer des garanties pour pouvoir <rire> permettre aux, aux privés qui veulent investir mais qui ne peuvent pas supporter les risques d'un default de paiement d'une collectivité locale, eh bien, les pouvoirs publics doivent intervenir. Et quand on utilise l'aide publique au développement, au lieu que pour faire des petits dons, mais pour consolider une garantie qui permette précisément euh, de pouvoir couvrir ce que le marché n'arrive pas à couvrir. Ce n'est pas une subvention. C'est là où le marché ne peut pas arriver parce qu'il n'arrive pas à être à être à recevoir le triple A, par exemple. Mais ce n'est pas parce qu'il n'y a pas le triple A qu'il n'y a pas le besoin. Comment on peut faire en sorte que le secteur privé arrive là, il n'y a pas le triple A, mais il y a le besoin Eh bien, c'est là où il faut créer des garanties qui puissent enlever le risque. Et en cas de problème, eh bien, finalement, il y a une police d'assurance encore plus grande qui peut intervenir. Et c'est là, je pense, qu'on euh, euh, peut le faire au niveau de projet, mais encore mieux au niveau euh, de la gouvernance qui s'est faite au niveau local. Parce que c'est là où le mélange, euh, se, se, euh, je dirais, réussit le mieux. Et après tout, c'est un forum sur la gouvernance. J'insiste sur ce fait que la gouvernance rapproche la politique et permet de faire des, des bons choix là où on est proche des citoyens et des décisions qui se prennent à ce niveau-là. Donc c'est là où je crois aussi la nouvelle politique de développement doit se reformuler pour être un peu plus proche et efficace. Merci, merci. Um, Minister Karazi, any, any two final words before I conclude? Yeah, I guess uh, it is very important that the civil society and private sector has a responsibility. But the major responsibility has to be put on the governments and the states because they are responsible to enforce Paris Agreement and the Convention. And if they do not do their responsibility nationally, it doesn't work. For example, the United States has withdrawn from the Paris Agreement. 
this means that uh, even private sector in the United States do not have any motivation to uh, enforce uh, their requirements of the Paris Agreement. Mm -hmm. One more thing is that Paris Agreement puts some responsibility on developed countries to help uh, developing countries. And that has not been materialized as well to the uh, utmost which is respected, expected. Therefore, developing countries, especially in Africa, need uh, support, need financial support from developing countries, uh, not only financial, but uh, in terms of uh, having access to technologies to develop themselves to the situation that uh, uh, would be uh, I mean, in better shape. Euh, merci, euh, Monsieur le ministre. Ben, merci, mes panélistes. Je pense que le temps qui nous est alloué, qui nous a été imparti, est pratiquement fini. Je ne pourrais pas faire la conclusion, la, la synthèse de débat aussi riche, mais je vais peut-être donner quelques éléments de certitude qui, à mon sens, a émergé de cette discussion. Mais avant ça, je voudrais euh, appuyer ce que un des, un des citoyens de l'Agora a dit, que... Euh, que le changement climatique, ce n'est un, pas, un, pas un sprint, c'est un marathon, c'est un travail de très long terme. Et donc, il faut investir déjà au niveau de l'école pour l'éducation euh, environnementale. Parce que c'est dans le changement de la culture, de l'attitude des gens, que dépendra le changement climatique. climatique. Donc, l'investissement au niveau des écoles, c'est extrêmement important. Mais ce que je retire de cette discussion, c'est deux choses. Euh, premièrement, euh, en matière de changement climatique, la science est dite, mais la messe n'est pas dite. Je m'explique. La science est dite et, et, et on a, on, il est clair que euh, le monde va euh, euh, vers un iceberg climatique si on ne fait pas extrêmement attention. Euh, et comme 97,5% des scientifiques sont d'accord, il euh, euh, y a un danger. La messe n'est pas dite euh, parce qu'on peut toujours éviter ce danger. Euh, pour éviter ce danger, il y a un acteur principal sur lequel nous pouvons tous compter, ce sont les villes. Et pour les raisons qu'on a discutées tout à l'heure, simplement parce que, euh, en appliquant le principe de proximité, la ville est plus proche du citoyen que l'État, que, que les États me, me pardonnent un tout petit peu, mais c'est parce qu'il y a cette proximité du citoyen vers la ville euh, qu'il incombe à la ville de prendre... Euh, le, le, le rôle de premier plan, naturellement avec l'appui des États, l'appui des partenaires, l'appui des investisseurs institutionnels et financiers comme les assurances et autres, mais le travail vectoriel, le travail de leadership, à mon avis, revient, revient à la ville. Euh, cette discussion vient de, de démontrer encore une fois l'importance de, de l'agenda pour, euh, pour le développement 2030, qui vous, qui vous rappelez, se, 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 se résume en ces cinq P. Euh, le peuple, euh, euh, travaillant en partenariat, euh, peut euh, développer euh, la paix et la prospérité et sauver notre planète. C'est ce nouveau contrat social que nous devons créer, qui implicitement est dans l'agenda 2030. Et comme on l'a dit dans cette discussion, et je le répète ici en termes de conclusion, parce que c'est un peu le thème de notre forum, euh, la, la gouvernance qui est euh, l'objectif numéro 16, et le point central, le point nodal dans tout, dans tout le travail que nous faisons. Si nous appuyons la gouvernance, surtout la gouvernance au niveau des villes, la gouvernance au niveau local, la gouvernance de proximité, proximité avec le citoyen, euh, nous pourrons éviter le clash climatique et cesser, nous, euh, 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 êtres humains, euh, d'être des, des talibans du climat. Et je voudrais vous remercier sur cette note. Encore merci pour votre attention. Merci beaucoup.